Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Festival of Social Science event um, at a virtual University of Birmingham. Um, my name's Will Leggett. Um, I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology at Birmingham, and I'm joined by my co-host, Scott Taylor, who's a readership, uh, reader in leadership and organisation in our Birmingham Business School. And tonight we're discussing the, uh, the enticing idea of political mindfulness. Um, and before we do anything else, um, I thought we would join together with Rachel Lilly, who's uh, one of our uh, panellists this evening. And Rachel is going to set the scene by leading us uh, in a calming <laughs> two minute practice uh, of, of mindfulness. Rachel. Yeah, thank you, Will. So we're just going to take a moment, to, as they say, just to arrive. So you might want to notice right now um, where, where your attention's at and how you feel before we even start. Where, what's the baseline you're moving from? So when we're thinking about mindfulness, particularly in the context of maybe decision making, um, working with others, we're thinking about how our attention is and how that's impacting our perception right now. So just start by connecting with how, how you are in this at this time. Do you feel distracted? Do you feel hungry? Do you feel quite calm? Just checking out um, where you're at before we add anything. And once you've done that, then Let's just kind of go in and first off, take off a layer of tension. I often start with my jaw, just noticing any tightness in the jaw and just trying to release that a little, let the tongue rest in the lower jaw. Let your shoulders shuffle down your back a little. Often during the day, they've tightened They've uh, moved up a little bit, let them soften back and down. And maybe feel the back of the body. Notice any support you've got behind you and allow yourself to settle slightly into that without slumping. But to feel the back connected, the sit bones connected onto the seat. Notice the felt sense of your feet on the floor. And as you gather the attention around the lower body and the back of the body, often the breath just slightly deepens. And we're impacting the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system here which takes our perception into a slightly different state. So just explore with that, taking a few slightly deeper breaths down towards your navel, into your belly. Enjoying that out breath. Because as you allow that out breath to deepen slightly, you're impacting your nervous system, you're taking yourself into a slightly more resting state. And in that resting state, our peripheral vision widens a little. We become a little bit more connected to the background felt sense. We're able to notice a little bit more. So checking through the body, if there's any place in the body you notice that you're really tensing um, around the hands or the legs, just see if you can take a layer of tension away. And notice now, as you do that, 
where your attention is, what the felt sense is now relative to a couple of minutes ago. Is there anything different? Has anything changed? So this is the exploration we can use mindfulness to help with a kind of gathering and exploration of our felt state, our inner state and our perceptive state. So taking one last breath as you maybe lift or open your eyes, taking in the screen and trying to maintain any softness as your perceptive state meets the world, that wider perception. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much, Rachel. Can we not just do that for the hour? <laughs> that's a great, uh, uh, well, that's the introduction to what, what we're dealing with when we talk about this thing called mindfulness. That was just perfect, thank you. Um, so tonight, as I said, we're focusing on this you know, idea of, of political mindfulness. I think it was in 2014 when Time Magazine um, announced the mindful mindfulness revolution. But of course, since then, this thing called mindfulness has become so ubiquitous, taken for granted um, in our schools, our workplaces, health settings, um, even the military uh, and, in, and in political settings. So it seems that everybody's living in the moment. Uh, but unsurprisingly, um, there was a backlash around the theme of so-called mindfulness with concerns about its commodification, that it encourages a turn away from the world, a kind of inward, even narcissistic uh, sensibility. Um, but maybe, just maybe, there's even been a backlash against the backlash. Um, and perhaps that's what I think has brought uh, our panellists uh, the interest in this uh, event here tonight. Um, we've got a sense that what we're looking for is um, a shared desire about around what we can take forward um, in the sense of imagining mindfulness as, yes, a profoundly valuable individual practice, um, but also something that perhaps can connect us to social engagement um, and even perhaps social transformation. So to discuss this, I'm, I'm really delighted to introduce um, our, our two speakers. Um, Paul Shumilovich has got the rather imposing title of the Head of Transformation Europe at uh, HSBC uh, Bank. Paul's a friend of our, our business school. He's held um, key senior international roles in the banking sector as well as non-exec positions um, in the third sector. But crucially, he also describes himself as a novice meditator. Um, and I dare say may even be known as the mindful banker. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so welcome, Paul. Um, and Paul will be our first speaker and he'll be uh, followed by Rachel, uh, who we've just met. And Rachel was recently begun as a, a senior uh, fellow in leadership development um, at Birmingham's uh, Leadership Institute. Um, and she's a, a, an academic consultant and trainer and uses uh, mindfulness and behavioral uh, insights um, in developing people-centered approaches to um, leadership and, and systems leadership. Um, so uh, Paul and Rachel will each speak uh, for around 10 minutes each. Uh, and what we'll encourage you to do is to post any questions that you have uh, while they're speaking or, or afterwards into the chat function um, and, and Scott, uh, my colleague Scott there is going to um, collate, uh, look over and, and collate um, the, the, the chat and then we'll in, in invite people to speak to their questions um, because that's the, the, you know, the, the key part of this session is, is, is to get the, the engagement um, in the Q&A um, and we'll have plenty of time for that in the second half of the session when we open it up to that discussion and at the very end I'll just encourage Rachel and Paul to reflect back on, on, on what we've heard. So. Um, that's, that's the agenda for the hour. Uh, I hope that sounds okay. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Will. I'm just gonna share my screen. I will make sure, does that all seem okay your end? Right. Uh, fantastic. Um, 
So good, good evening, everybody. First of all, a real thank you for inviting me along to this session. Intrigued, uh, happy to share uh, some of my experiences and reflections, but uh, just as much, if not more so, uh, really intrigued to see how the discussion uh, evolves and develops. So thank you for inviting me, a real pleasure to be here. And Rachel, thank you for that start, which I'm actually quite proud to say, probably in the last month, I've attended only, but still, three or four meetings at HSBC that have begun like that, uh, which I, I certainly could not say that six, 12 months ago. Uh, so there is little fires being lit for sure, uh, but I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, so I, I've got 10 minutes, so I'll move at relative pace. And just as a brief intro uh, to, to me and my background, and maybe a, a very small but quick build on Will's introduction. Um, so Paul Shemilovich, I'm married with two young kids, so uh, live in Kent with a nine and 11 year old. Uh, I'm spending most of my weeks in Paris at the moment, which is where my new role is based. Uh, I'm very proud that I'm an alumni of the University of Birmingham, uh, so very fond of my uh, five, five years, uh, 20 years or so ago, plus plus. Um, and ever since that, my career really has been uh, across two uh, large banks, the first being Lloyds Banking Group. Um, and then over the last 12, 12 years, I've spent uh, all of my time with HSBC. I suppose as a banker, uh, people tend to switch off when you speak sometimes. The more unique and maybe interesting aspect of my background is that uh, I'm certainly not your traditional banker. Uh, not really an expert in any technical sense, more of a fixer uh, who's been moved around the world in to different parts of the bank, actually. So I've done some big frontline roles uh, where I've managed a couple of thousand people. I've done most of the uh, key head office roles in banking, in retail and wealth banking. Uh, and then over the last five years has been much more in the digital technology space, uh, completely selfishly, uh, because I want to make sure I, I'm still relevant in the future. Uh, so I've made sure that in the last few roles, I get a lot more exposure to the digital world. Um, and as part of that, the final piece, I've been fortunate, as you will see from this map and will have gathered, um, I spent a couple of years working in the US. I spent three, four years across Asia in Hong Kong, Singapore, um, and then a similar period of time, three, four years across the Middle East out of Lebanon, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and then of course, in between that back and forth in the UK. Um, I will move on very quickly because today is very much uh, around mindfulness, but I think important for you to have a bit of context of me, the human being, uh, not just a, a corporate banker. Um, so there are there are only three pictures that I'm going to share with you. So again, as a banker, that wasn't easy for me not to come up with lots of slides, but you'll be happy to know their pictures. And only, only one of them is me in a yoga pose, don't worry. Um, my mindfulness journey began, I would say, six or seven years ago. I had a career defining moment where I was put into a really senior role within HSBC to lead a major project. And six months into that role, um, I had found myself in a situation where I had anywhere between 16 to 20 meetings a day. I was pretty much late to most of them. Um, I was unprepared for all of them. Uh, and I certainly wasn't at my best. Um, that definitely plays to my character. I tend to be high energy, quite intense not great at slowing down, pressing pause and speaking a lot more slowly, something that I've been working on over the last six, seven years. Um, at that point, um, I was fortunate that HSBC supported me uh, with engagement with a coach uh, and it was a mindfulness coach. Um, and we very quickly <coughs> moved to working out how I could become much more mindful in the workplace and actually I had a couple of things that we, we, we did. One of them was having triggers. And one of my triggers was definitely around how do I slow down to go faster, which I love as a concept. And it's something that works really well with me as someone who, who can be a bit intense. Um, and I created lots of rules um, around personal rocks, around diary management, around the maximum number of meetings I could have in a day, et cetera, et cetera. And I was held to account. And over a period of about six months, I used some very tangible, practical things to just help me be a bit more present and in control. Um, as part of that, I took up yoga. Uh, I'm a very keen runner. 
Uh, so yoga was not easy uh, on my hamstrings and uh, from my football days at the University of Birmingham. Uh, but it's I certainly found it as something that helped me again to find moments of pause find moments of peace uh, and moments where I could try and slow my mind up. And I have to say, so I don't preach for the first 12 to 18 months of doing yoga. Um, my, my wife would always laugh because I would leave a yoga session and I would have created a story in my mind uh, to remind myself of things I needed to do that popped into my mind during yoga. So I was doing yoga, but my mind was still very active. Um, and I didn't have one of these, which is, usually never too far away uh, to write down something that needs to get done. But I have to say six, seven years down the line, I'm able to go into a yoga session and for an hour in the middle of the day, because I tend to do my yoga in between work meetings, be able to switch off and not walk out of that straight into something else. Uh, but certainly a journey that I continue, uh, continue along and haven't uh, finished. Um, this picture is something from three weeks ago uh, in the woods round the corner from where we live in Kent. Uh, the relationship that I was very fortunate, <laughs> excuse me, very fortunate to have built with my uh, mindfulness coach, a lady called Laura, who's simply tremendous. So once every two or three months, um, she will drive over to Kent and we'll go for a walk in the woods for a couple of hours. She'll bring tea. Uh, we sit down on a log, we have a cup of tea and we talk about uh, some of the some of the deepest challenges I might have, which could be <laughs> could be uh, <laughs> quite deep, deep conversations around childhood to actually some very basic work challenges that I might be facing on a day to day basis. Uh, they've become a real rock for me and the opportunity to be able to go out and step away from the office and be um, in the kind of natural. <coughs> excuse the coughing. I'm. I'm also recovering from COVID, I forgot to mention to you, Will. Uh, so I'm in my final day of isolation, but still struggling a little bit. Um, but, th but those moments of being in nature um, is something that I also have really, really tried to um, implement and introduce uh, within the work environment. And maybe that's the final piece. I would just spend a couple of minutes on um, and very happy to come back in Q&A. As part of my journey six, seven years ago, within a year or two, um, it became quite important for me to um, expose as much as I could my teams in HSBC, um, but also <coughs> where I had the opportunity, a much broader uh, group of individuals to the things I was experiencing. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples. I, I, in a couple of roles ago in HSBC, looked after a team of about 500 people as global head of digital. Um, I would, on a regular basis, probably every couple of months, uh, get the senior top team together, which were about 20 individuals, and we would have a two-day offsite. So they would fly in from Hong Kong, the US, and from across the UK. And I decided to be quite bold and brave and decided that I would uh, run some mindful, mindfulness sessions with them. And very quickly over a two year period, all of our offsites uh, became mindfulness offsites and not work related offsites. So I remember very clearly, uh, and it has to be one of my fondest memories. Uh, the first time that we did this, um, all of my team up until the day of the two day offsite were asking me, what presentations do we need to present? What topics do we need to prepare for? I said, we don't need to prepare for anything. I remember introducing the session and saying, we're not going to do any work. We're going to spend a day and a half together. We're going to do some stuff that I'm going to ask you to be open minded about, but be very forthright with your feedback. But it will be uncomfortable. It's going to be different. Um, half of the room were excited. Half were terrified because they said, we can't we don't have time for this. There's so much to do. We're so busy. We need to resolve so many issues. Cut long story short, we run a day and a half of amazing sessions. Uh, to give you a flavor, a couple of them was uh, in a pair, you would go off, uh, so you would leave the building, and we were in the countryside, so it was quite helpful, go for a walk for 45 minutes together uh, and come back and tell us how it was. So obviously lots of questions, So, but, but what do we need to talk about? No, no agenda, no agenda, no work. Uh, then people came back, we shared, then you had to go off and do it individually. 
go for a 45 minute walk on your own, come back and share. I, I, and, and Will, I'll stop there because I'd love to give more examples, but I'm conscious of time. The, 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 the powerful ending of that is at the end of the two days, uh, people just felt amazing, right? They said, oh my God, I didn't realize how badly I needed that. I'm ready to go. I feel fantastic. And we didn't talk about work. We didn't resolve any issues, but people felt amazing having taken that day and a half to reconnect individually as a team, with nature, et cetera. And I, I, I also do that with our graduate populations now because I'm the sponsor of the graduate program in the UK, uh, because I get very passionate around the temptation is when you get to senior levels of whatever industry, you get the luxury to do some of these things. or you get the luxury like I do of a mindfulness coach, right? Um, whereas I think the power um, and the future in the changing world that we have is I think the most, the most impactful individuals, the most impactful leaders, are going to be the ones that are vulnerable, that are compassionate, and that are very open and understanding of how you give space, create environments, and encourage people in their own way uh, to be mindful and to be mindful in the workplace. Which I, you know, I, I will preach this bit from my experience makes you much, much more effective um, in that work environment. Never mind at, at home with the family, with the kids, whatever it may be. Well, I will pause there because you probably sense I could keep talking about this, uh, but I, I, I'm sure I'll get an opportunity to share a few more things. Well, that's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. That's an incredibly rich uh, layered story about that, that transition from, you know, f finding mindfulness individually um, and, and really scaling that up <laughs> into that, that vast institutional setting um, and, and the lessons that can be taken forward there. So thank you so much for that. And, and, and I think that sets the scene um, for Rachel's interests um, and, and work very nicely. So Rachel, let me hand over to you. Great, let me get my screen share here. And, and just to encourage the audience, um, please do post any thoughts and questions in the chat um, and I will open it up for a full, full Q&A when uh, Rachel is finished. <laughs> that's the wrong one we were practicing this earlier and yes there we go is that right we're good Perfect. okay yeah thanks paul that's really interesting stuff and uh hopefully um yeah and uh, yeah i love those team days that you're talking about i'd love to have been a part of those so maybe this this builds on hopefully this builds on what you um your talk and what you've shared so, as Will said, I fairly recently joined the Birmingham Leadership Institute at the University of Birmingham. But I, I have this lovely picture in the background because I actually live in Aberystwyth. And so you've got a picture of Aberystwyth Pier there with the amazing starlings. And I also have a sense because a lot of my work's been around working on what would be called wicked problems. And we'll touch a little bit on that, like climate change, social justice issues. And the starlings really reflect that in the sense that they're in this kind of chaotic space um, coming out of the pier and then they enter these beautifully um, uh, curated murmurations. And this is what we're kind of, for me, what I'm working with in terms of how can mindfulness support working with complexity so that we're moving in the kind of directions that we want to be moving in. So I'll start with a little bit of me and my journey in the context that I've been working in. So this was me in my 20s, a little while ago now. So I um, started very much in social activism. I worked on homelessness. And over time, I became really interested in the links between sustainability and social justice, which um, took me from working in London, in NGOs in London, to working, to, to being in Wales and working on an environmental project in Wales. And I guess the thing that really saddens and worries me now is that I now have a daughter who's about the age that I was then and just kind of got to her twenties. And um, we thought, at that time that you know we could really do something about reducing co2 we thought it was urgent then over 20 years ago 
but in her lifetime, carbon emissions, CO2 emissions have increased substantially, have not decreased at all. And um, yeah, that's very sobering, I think. It's also a bit of a kind of reflection on, well, what were we doing over the last 20 years? Whatever it was, it doesn't seem to have worked, certainly in the way that we wanted it to work. And certainly, one kind of um, idea we peddled really was this idea that if we just share um, some fairly shocking uh, and again sobering information and people will surely listen and go and do something differently and this was the hockey stick graph which we used a lot which just demonstrated the radical shift in temperatures over time and how this had to be human created because it links to the industrial the, the, the industrial age coming in and if you just looked at this graph you would have to act surely but obviously this didn't work people contested it heavily um, and uh, are basically what we would have called information deficit approach um, thinking this was going to be quite a simple answer didn't work and the other thing we hoped for um, was kind of hero leadership, that people would get this and then our leaders would go out and uh, be courageous because the facts were compelling, a bit like the pandemic almost, we would have thought, um, and do something about it. But obviously that doesn't, hasn't worked because the, the truth is this is a highly complex problem and it's a wicked problem. And you see models like this, which show the, the multiple places where we need to act and how they're all completely interlinked in terms of things like climate change. And um, what we really need is, and you're hearing it talked about again and again, you know, COP26, um, uh, I spoke to someone from DEFRA the other day in the government, they're saying, you know, we need systemic leadership. And that's about, I've got this wonderful picture because that's about getting off the dance floor and onto the balcony and looking down at the dance floor and uh, kind of seeing the whole of the system. So how do we create, we can use models, we can use um, how we use our perception to try and see the whole story, to try and see that system and act wisely within that system. And what we tend to do is get caught on the dance floor, doing tricks on the dance floor, um, getting caught in a little piece of the system and not working in a wise way with the whole of that system. And also either relying on information or relying on hero leadership. So we know now there's more people, you'll hear it more, we need more systemic ways of working. Uh, and here you've got, you know, that real bird's eye view, maybe uh, of, a, of a good team who are obviously taking a real systemic view of um, what's happening below them. But the key thing here is um, we're looking down on them. And obviously that is one thing that's often really missed in systemic thinking, systemic leadership is the individuals are also part of the system and their perception is part of the system. What they're bringing to their view is part of the system. And what can you use to help them um, get an insight and work effectively with that internal system as part of the system? And my research, which I did over the last five, 10 years, really showed that, um, especially the areas I've worked in the public sector in Wales, is that leaders and people generally who are trying to shift a system don't understand the internal parts of that system. They don't understand their own minds. They don't understand how their own sense making, uh, how their emotions impact what they see and how they relate and how they take on information. And often things like mindfulness will come in as part of a well-being activity, part of a grounding activity. They won't come in as part of um, helping people take that systemic view and uh, Paul said some interesting stuff I'd be curious there because it kind of seems to almost straddle these two areas but largely particularly in the public sector mindfulness is offered in in the realm of well-being so yeah when you're burnt out that's when we get well-being um, so I've worked a lot of thinking about how mindfulness can uh, support us to see biases in the context of uh, behavioral economics, our cognitive and unconscious bias, working with more predictive models of mind. So rather than waiting for almost everything to go wrong and offering it that um, well-being space, 
taking it further back down the pipeline to uh, get people to understand the kind of biases and the expectations they bring to any situation um, that supports that more systemic thinking and also really interrelates with their perspective. Many people don't really understand how their, um, their perspective taking on others is actually uh, biased, basically making assumptions. How can we use mindfulness to help us challenge and check our, our assumptions about others so that we can really fully get the information in the room. So again, this is systemic thinking. Most of us in meetings make huge amounts of assumptions what other people are thinking or how they're perceiving the situation. And things like mindfulness can really widen our perception um, and make it easier for us to challenge and be challenged so that we can get that more systemic thinking. So I work in Wales. This is Mark Drakeford, the first minister in Wales. And um, I guess this is grounding this in practice. So the program that I did as part of my main piece of research over the last few years was delivered as a capacity to support more distributed leadership and more co-productive working. It, I actually never mentioned well-being. I didn't mention compassion or empathy, but the results were that people started to operate in ways that would be described as more empathetic, um, more um, yeah, collaborative. And uh, the, the stuff I delivered was very contextual. It was like people understanding themselves as part of a context, less as an individual. And that was very successful. Um, the first minister was very um, uh, positive about the program and the, the, the work that we'd done. So, and this is moving towards my final slide now. So um, when we're talking about, this is a model that I kind of developed over the time of my PhD. Often mindfulness as a journey to well-being is kind of for me on this side, you know, the eyes may be in a sense of slight disease. It's about individual change in a group context. And it was developed around stress, pain and depression. And it's about a journey to in a group setting. So the group setting is really important to individual ease. Whereas if we take mindfulness as a journey towards more systemic thinking, it's much more contextual, it's much more relational. It's about building adaptive capacities, systemic awareness, understanding how our expectations are influencing perception. It's much more developmental. So it's more on this side, moving towards a more systemic way of thinking. And obviously there's a link because sometimes we move from one to the, to the other. So in these more developmental areas, the MBIs are more deconstructive. They're more about challenging assumptions and biases, understanding systemic and sense-making processes um, with underpinning questions around how people interrelate, link to their identity, building capacities for um, systemic thinking. So very much contextual, very much systemic at various levels. So um, we can all do this. We're all in systems. We're all at systems at different levels. So this is something that shouldn't just be at a leadership level, but we're interested in distri distributed leadership and systemic ways of seeing and working. And so offering mindfulness in this kind of context, for me, is one of the key, um, the key requirements, the key needs we need to move uh, forward and towards things to um, change things like CO2 emissions um, and towards more social justice so that we see the world very differently and do something very differently. Wow. Rachel, thank you so much. That's terrific. Um, and I know that you, you, you and Paul had not conferred beforehand <laughs> about those presentations, but um, yeah, again, you know, incredibly rich and um, sort of complementing and elaborating on those insights about that, that transformation from um, individual to group and systems um, and that nice compliment in terms of thinking about the to, to complement Paul's world you know the, the public sector and, and the rollout into into the formal political sphere as well um, with, with an expansive agenda around issues like climate change so I, I I'm, I'm really pleased at the way you captured the full gamut of experience from individual well-being and practice up to hopes to, to change the world um, so that seems like a nice uh, launch into um, some, some discussion. Um, I know Scott has been uh, monitoring 
uh, the chat. So Scott, can I hand over to you to invite um, some contributions from our colleagues who've joined us? Thank you very much, Will. And um, thank you, uh, Jessica, for the, the questions and comments already in the chat area. If I can come to you in just a second. Um, but I wanted to start, um, start, start you off, Paul and Rachel, um, by, by th uh, asking you to, to talk us through a little bit the um, something which, which Rachel has raised and which I think we'll, we'll come back again and again, which is the, the reception of um, mindfulness from, from your colleagues or from your family or from you know, significant others. And you know, you know, what happens, how, how do people respond when you tell them that you're starting to, to practice mindfulness? Do you want me to go, Rachel? Is that okay? Oh. Um, so, gosh, uh, gr great question, really mixed. So th a, a few things I would say. There are managers and senior execs at HSBC who I would share this stuff with uh, because I know they will be open, accepting, and encouraging. And there is, uh, and, and maybe this is shame on me, there is definitely ones which I wouldn't even talk about this to. Uh, who I have either heard maybe speak or rightly or wrongly, I probably have biases uh, around uh, how they would respond to it. Um, but I think I, as part of my journey of the last six, seven years, have grown in confidence um, because I think I have more data points around the impact that it's had. So I think for me, it's definitely been a journey of personal confidence where at the beginning, to a point, it was maybe a dirty little secret at, uh, at, at work to the point, And I will share a very funny story very quickly, if I may, Scott. Uh, one of the things I did with the team that I first did this with, my top team, is after about six to nine months, most engaged with it. Not straight away, really mixed. And we always, <laughs> we didn't put too much pressure and I was always very keen to share the research and the data points around the effectiveness, individual and team effectiveness of going through these kind of journeys, because for some, that was the only reason they tried it. For others, they were much more open. But as part of that, uh, we did a free day, not a free full day, but two hours a day over three days, um, a meditation course um, for all of my top teams. So we three, had a guy- three days. Over three days, two hours every day. It's only two hours a day. So six hours in total. Uh, I had someone come into our Canary Wharf uh, office who run guided meditation, did some basic training, top tips, feedback. And we did that in the office. So we had to get a, uh, one of our boardrooms, which was had no windows because there would be too many people walking around saying, what the hell are these guys doing? They've all got their eyes closed. Some of them have put their hands out. Uh, but the funny thing was at the end of that, we also had some individual time to be given a personal mantra. And anyone who's done mantra meditation, I'm a very, very much a novice. I was, everyone was given their own word. And I, um, I basically was taken away into another room where <laughs> a candle was lit. And there was a mini kind of 15 minute ceremony when I was given my mantra. The, the candle set off a lot of alerts across Canary Wharf. And, and we almost had to evacuate 8,000 people. So I'm not sure I would even be here if this had happened. But I realized there was a commotion outside. And basically, all of the facility guys were trying to work out why it was triggered, because there's no fire anywhere. So I nearly got into a lot, a lot of trouble. <laughs> but I lived to tell the tale. Uh, and I got my mantra. And I still practice a bit of mantra meditation, uh, but certainly not strictly. So very mixed very mm. tough but i think my learning is be brave and be bold because i think there's a lot of people who will benefit and want to benefit um and what they need is some senior people to actually embrace it and give them permission that's that's a really good point to conclude that on paul thank you very much rachel do, do you find something similar when when you start to to talk about these practices or these ideas in organizations Well, I guess it's because the con I go in in a very different kind of way to organisations. Mm. And um, I guess I can say that sometimes there's some scepticism because of it's seen as a well-being activity or as a 
a kind of quirky spiritual activity, which um, in a way Paul was kind of alluding to that sometimes it obviously is. Um, but the context I deliver it in kind of really tries to put that to one side and make sense of it more as a, well, you know, you don't understand your own mind. Your mind is the thing that's doing the job that you need to use to, um, so, you know, so actually I'm very much coming in in a way that having done lots of research, lots of training, lots of working about the importance of us understanding how our minds work, how others' minds work. Mm -hmm. And for me, part of my research really was, um, was thinking about, well, a lot of people are taking up for mindfulness. You know, if mindfulness is the answer, what's the actual problem that mindfulness is actually pointing towards? And if I was just going to go back to that problem and kind of look at the problem in itself and the best way to deal with it in this context, um, then how would I then bring in mindfulness, but also bring in other elements that are actually out there that are pointing to supporting people to understand how their sense making, how their inner world impacts their external world. Uh, and then drawing from that. And then so I probably wouldn't, for example, bring mantras in for that very reason. Um, I would look at, you know, what is the thing that that's doing possibly, you know, what is the thing that a mantra, you know, does to somebody and what is out there that actually lands with people and that's suitable in this particular context. Um, I think that's quite important um, so that we separate, you know, it's fine if somebody wants to do that and that's, they're comfortable with that, but actually making it accessible, making it empowering, making it contextual and not so individual is quite key. That was a long answer, sorry. It's a really, really good, um, really good description. And it, it takes us um, really neatly to, to your question, Jessica, I think. And um, I believe you have the ability to unmute yourself, Jessica, and, and speak to your own question if you would like to do that. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, I raised a couple of questions in the chat window. Are you referring to the first one, which was around languaging and how to enable uh, how, how to make these practices more accessible? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you raised the issue of culture as well. Yes, yeah. yes. And that's one issue that I come up against a lot in my work. Um, we're a company training people in consciousness studies, in psychology, working through the University of uh, Liverpool, John Morse University. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the change makers that we're training, when they're going into context, they're often finding that they're needing to build bridges or find ways of languaging um, the, the kind of quite esoteric concepts like mindfulness, bodyfulness, uh, somatic experiencing, you know, so really working with the, the full range of human intelligences, but how to weave that in, how to bring that in effectively and not um, rub people up the wrong way or, or scare them or intimidate them. That's a question that often comes up. So I'd love, I'd love to hear Rachel's and Paul's take on that. Thank you. That's a great question, Jessica. Thank you. Rachel, you go first this time. Um, yes, sorry, I need to you. Um, well, do you know, uh, Jessica, part of my um, academic journey has been studying advertising and the um, advent of advertising and how Freud's um, cousin, was it, went across to the States um, to uh, help the advertisers out there. And one of the key things I remembered from that was that um, he pointed out, again, it's not about information deficit, it's about working out what the problem is and actually getting people to, I mean, I'm no, I don't want to advocate of advertising here, but in terms of the thinking around it, is that you help people understand the problem. And the problem that I was working with was actually you seem to be using your nervous system and your uh, cognitive and emotional processes. That seems to be what your, your job is day in, day out. Um, by getting narratives from people, they were saying, oh, well, we're, you know, we're talking to people, we're dealing with people's emotions. And I was like, well, this is the job of the nervous system and the cognitive, cognitive, emotional systems. And most organizations and public sector organizations are working on a very outdated understanding of what either their nervous system is uh, and, and what um, 
you know, their cognitive systems are. Now in sport, they've learned this. They no longer train people to do football like they did in the 80s, where you could carry on drinking as much as you liked. As long as you kick the ball in the back of the net at the end of the day, you could party all weekend. Um, and then they've realized that doesn't work because the understanding of physiology has dramatically changed and of sports and muscles. So it's, for me, it's a similar thing. Our jobs have changed. There's huge amounts of complexity. The volume of work we have to deal with is huge. We need to re-understand the physiology, uh, the biology, our consciousness uh, much better. And then, and so when you described it like that, using the kind of vacuum cleaner kind of model, actually you've got a problem here, you didn't realize you had, then uh, people are actually very open. Um, I didn't have any pushback at all then. Yeah, it sounds like you did a really, really good job um, to, to, give, to give yourself some credit. Paul, Paul what's been, been your experience there? Yeah, no, I, um, I mean, Rachel, Rachel answered that perfectly. So I, I suppose maybe if I could add, from a my practical experience for me, and, and I talked a bit about this previously, Jessica, I think there's been a mix of approaches for me, because I think there's definitely individuals I've had with, in my team who would naturally um, kind of reject this kind of stuff. Um, so the, there is probably rightly or wrongly, you know, I had the opportunity as the uh, as, 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 as a senior individual managing a team of saying, this is something that I think our team needs at the moment. Um, there, there was a big part of that for me and always has been, of being very vulnerable with my journey which I think, you know, the feedback I've always had from my teams is when I've introduced this, I would usually probably take 20 minutes or half an hour to talk about, let me tell you some of the things I've gone through and how that's felt, the things I've learned. And maybe there is, you know, I have to be careful, there might be a, a bit of kind of arrogance stroke uh, authority with that, right? Um, of saying, you know, I, I think there could be something in this for you as well. But more importantly for me, the, the, the other bit that worked really well for me, Jessica, is the power of doing this as a team. So the first team I did this with six, seven years ago, six years ago, we still have a WhatsApp group with people all over the world where we talk to each other. It's incredible because we've been through that journey where we've, you know, we've sat around, people have sometimes cried, they've reflected on something really deep. And, you know, oh, it, it makes me smile, not because people have cried, but, but to think back. You know, we stripped away all of the corporate, excuse my language for a second, bullshit, right? We we're just human beings who are trying to do a good job as a team together. And we just said, right, how do we just press pause and be with each other for a day or two, get to know each other as human being, do lots of sharing. And guess what? You know, you just open the floodgates, right? For 80 percent, 90 percent of the people, as Rachel, as Rachel said, I think, in her final point, people didn't realize they needed it. Right. And the. Uh, the working, the kind of muscle of your brain. But I think if I'm very honest, I've seen it work really well where you've got a senior leader who's highly engaged, right? And it's been, and I, I see that more and more. So the little fires that were lighting in HSBC are usually senior leader led because they give permission. And we still live in that world, unfortunately, and HSBC is a traditional bank. But if, you know, if I see my boss do it, then I can do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much for the questions, Jessica, and the comments. Um, so we've got a final sort of third thread to pull on here, um, an issue which is, has been raised by um, Enrico. So Enrico, if you'd, if you'd like to do the same as, as Jessica and um, speak to your question, or if you prefer not to, I can do that for you. So just uh, either go ahead or I'll pick it I up. I can go ahead, no problem. In a way, I think Paul uh, you already touched on it uh, with what you just said about uh, cutting through what you termed corporate bullshit. But, uh, and kind of linking to what Rachel was talking about before. Um, well, the question as it's written there, it was, you shared a very personal and intimate experience. And uh, maybe my question is really to you and, uh, um, as it is written there, basically. I don't know if you read it, but I think it's a it's such a good question, Enrico, and I think it it does it re re relates also to Rachel's work and and, and what, what Will was talking about in the introduction. I think for for all of us at the moment is 
um, whether we question um, the, um, the the social conditions that we're working within or that we're living within, and uh, you know whether we give up flying, for example, um, or or or, and it's <clears throat> it's a it's a very very complex question. So I'm going to invite Rachel and Paul just to address it in the way that that sure. you think best. Yeah. Do, Rachel, if you don't mind, because I did just read it, Enrico, and I think it's a great question, and I, I, I will share a few things that come to mind straight away. I think it definitely has made an impact on, on me, but I would definitely say, again, not to sound preachy, it's a kind of ongoing process. Uh, what, what I mean by that, sorry, because there, there wasn't much actual detail in that bit of the answer, is I have much more of a thinner work mask or whatever it was that I used to wear I think I've become much more comfortable in my own skin and I I think that probably happened earlier in my career uh, from a corporate perspective than is the norm um, and that's the feedback I've had and I the for me 100% of the driver is the mindfulness piece right it's it's the personal work I've done on uh, on myself the work with the coach the yoga slowing down uh, being much more comfortable with being vulnerable. I was at a conference last week where I was asked to speak and the conference was all about how, how do you get the, your teams and leaders to be more resilient during COVID and how did you maintain resilience? And actually I said, you know, I've got a strong belief that actually it's the opposite. So throughout COVID, I used to open up my team meetings by saying how hard a day I'd had the day before, trying to help my wife, help with homeschooling, I haven't answered half of the emails and I've missed a couple of meetings and it's hard, it's shit, but I'm still going. Now your turn, Enrico, tell me about how shit your last two days were. And there was something, and I don't know, maybe I'm going off piste, Rachel will probably bring me back, but there was something cathartic and something that I don't think I would have done six, seven years ago. And maybe some of that is age, maturity, et cetera, right? But I think mindfulness definitely played an aspect for me of being able to just be comfortable more of the time in my own skin, you know, and just live life, right? And not get too stressed about the day-to-day -day work. And the irony of it, that apparently makes me a better leader, right? Because I'm calm. Oh God, Paul's in control. I'm not in control. I just don't give a shit, <laughs> excuse my language, <laughs> as much as I used to. But, but I think there is, you know, something that, I don't know, inner peace of some sort, right? Uh, and again, don't get me wrong, I think 70% of the time I don't have that, but I now recognize it. So I love final mm -hmm. point. I think what this process is also helping me with, I recognize a good day and a bad day. And I remember that was the early challenge that I had around what was a mindful day and what was a day where I was out of control, uh, erratic, talk too fast, late for lots of meetings, and what was not a day like that. I'll pause so, there. Yeah, absolutely. So that I think that that speaks directly to to your research interests as well, Rachel, in terms of um, systemic issues within the work environment and 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 an individual challenging in practice of those systemic issues. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, most people have done mindfulness that's come from therapeutic or spiritual kind of background um, or roots. And that does tend to be because of its nature more individualized. Now, for me, if we're really going to create the change that needs to happen, um, I think, as I said, really, we need to remodel mindfulness. So it seriously does make people question the structures, the context they're in, because what I would like my programs to do is to help people see that they are entirely contextual. They are um, I don't want to be delivering a mindfulness uh, that's kind of an add on. It's um, to something that's dysfunctional and not really working. I want to deliver a mindfulness that empowers people to see um, to see that, yeah, what we've where what we've got isn't working and to change it and to do something different and actually to be in states of discomfort. Um, so maybe with, uh, relating to what Paul says to actually be able to help hold discomfort with some level enough tolerance enough ease to have the conversations to do the work that's going to really really change things because like i put up there the hero leaders you know we've just had cop 26 
um, people are wired not uh, for hyperbolic discounting, you know, to discount the future. Climate change is, you know, impossible in that sense because it's all in the future. How can we create leaders that can live with, you know, difficulty um, and really create really question the systems that they are reliant, currently reliant on for their very livelihoods, but might need to change in order to get the change that we, that we need. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty passionate that mindfulness does that and much more of it. Yeah, that's, that's great, Rachel. Thank you very much. And that, there's, there's a very nice comment also in the chat area for you, Rachel, about the Mindfulness in Schools project, which I hope you, you've got a moment to look at. But I think bringing us back to politics bring, brings us back to you, Will. Um, and uh, we've got the last sort of five minutes. Uh, thanks, uh, Scott. And thank you. Um, uh, everyone in the audience for um, some really thoughtful and, and generous questions and observations. Um, I was going to try and uh, sort of wrap things up, but I, I'm a political sociologist and uh, as we've touched on the area of the, the political sphere and wider social change, um, I've got a bit of a, I suppose a bit of a tricky uh, question, which, which I'll throw out there actually, um, which is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sold on the, the advantages that you, you know, this, as I say, I'm very struck by this journey you've described from individual awareness, well-being, all the way through collective experience, institution and capacity building up, up to actually intervening in the world. And I just wondered if you, if you could flesh out um, what's the real value added? What's the, the difference between mindfulness in that respect and good old fashioned political awareness or having a social a sense of social conscience? What, what was, what's really distinctive for you about mindfulness as opposed to just that, that broader critical mindset. I'm, I'm going to be quite brutal here, Will, and say that you've got 60 seconds each. <laughs> you go, I'm still thinking. <laughs> well, political awareness in itself does not, what we understand now is that um, we didn't, we co-create, our perceptive state creates the, you know, the state that we're in. When I was a political activist in my 20s, I did not understand at all that my very construction was completely impacting how I understood and how everybody else understands, um, you know, the issue that's out there that we have a political view on, that we are you know, until I, it wasn't, and things like mindfulness really helped me and just kind of build, go beyond political, go beyond, extend my kind of perceptive state. So actually my political awareness is far deeper, I would say, far more uh, accepting of different sides and different stories. Can, you know, this kind of uh, bi-party kind of way of debating complex problems, you know, it's just, you know, you can see mindfulness really supports that. So I think it creates space where you can actually do the work, you know, not just have a baseline political awareness. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, Paul, you get the last word. Yeah, I, I mean, Will, the thing I wrote when, when you asked him that question is I, I wrote real and human. And, you know, I don't know if that, that's in the right context of, of, of your question, but I think if I reflect back to some of the things I've talked about, when I think about them and what was different about that and the mindfulness work that I did myself or with a team is, you know, a lot of the feedback I got, again, from the individuals that were part of that, were just, we just stripped away all the noise, stripped away all the noise and we were just either individually or collectively there together as human beings, equal, no boss, no whatever it may be, and just that real human connection stri stripping away uh, the, you know, if I may say the, bull the bullshit, right? Whatever that is, whether that's corporate world, political, whatever it may be. And that was really powerful. And I think that's, you know, again, that's one data point. That's why the connection I built with that team is something that's still really, really strong today. And, you know, I, I, I think the power of that and the effectiveness of that team, and by the way, at no point did I say that team did the most amazing job in delivering uh, the biggest strategic change program that basically HSBC had ever done. So I wrote, you know, I, I, I forgot the single biggest thing, that team was ridiculously effective and people still talk about what they delivered. And, you know, most will not know or would probably not acknowledge that it's because of mindfulness and the work that we did together. I have no doubt that it was. 
thanks so much, Paul um, and, and Rachel. Um, um, and to everybody who's who's joined this this evening, I can hear the clocks on Old Joe, the clock on Birmingham campus striking eight. So I think that's the signal for me to say we've covered a remarkable amount of ground. Um, thank you to everyone for your participation. Um, and I hope that we can all go away and have uh, an optimistic and mindful uh, evening. So good night and thank you to everybody. <laughs>